Um, thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Conversations about hope. You've missed the intro because I didn't record it, but <laughs> Julie, um, for God's sake, let Asha up for a minute. Would you like to just introduce yourself and say hello and just talk a bit maybe about why you wanted to do this, why you agreed? Yeah, um, so hi everybody, I'm uh, Julie Hesmadalsh, I'm an actor and, uh, and a writer, I suppose now, <laughs> and um, and yeah, and, and Anna and I have worked together um, on a couple of projects now, and we have always taught about how to keep going in dark times, it's been a subject that's been of great interest to us always, about how to keep your spirits up in quite dark and difficult times, which these undoubtedly are. And um, yeah, so Anna approached me and said that she wanted to start these webinars and have conversations with people around it. And I suppose I want to start by saying, as in all things, I don't come to this from any sage-like position. I don't have the answers around hope and despair and optimism and darkness at all. But it is a subject that really, really interests me. And it is something that I battle with and grapple with all the time as I know Anna does. So mm. I think probably a good place to start would be to bounce it back to you Anna and for you to tell people you know what was the process of coming to, to these conversations because I know that it was a, it's something that came to you before Christmas and you thought this might be useful to people yeah well I think things have felt so relentless in so many different ways um politically certainly uh um sort of within society I think Covid and lots of different things are having knock-on effects in people's personal lives, Pe people's personal struggles seem to be massively magnified because we're living in this really kind of insecure place um, that feels like so uncertain and I think I mean I'm you know I think we're going to talk openly about I think our political leanings will be clear I feel that we it's impossible to trust the people in power probably more than it ever has been before and like so to be honest not to just start by blowing smoke up your ass Julie but when I am um, when I feel hopeless I there's people that I really draw on and do you know what it's just about going I know they're there and you're one of those people because I, I, I know that you'll always be carrying on. <laughs> you'll always be doing things. And as you know, it's quite often I'll like send you a long distraught voice note about something and then and then you'll never hear from me for again for weeks. And then I'll be like, oh, I'm fine now, Ju. Um, it's true. But, it's yeah, true, everyone. <laughs> but, but I think so. I think that first our uh, first point I think that we reach out to each other so one of the pluses of um of Covid but also of living in this um current situation that we're living in is that we reach out to each other I think uh, we've stopped looking up or look you know looking in in many ways we've stopped looking uh, to authority for answers because we know those answers aren't there and we're starting to look you know it's that bloody awful thing at the beginning of covid we're all in this together boris said but we weren't but you know but but we are in it together and so i think it's about kind of looking out and i also think you know when you said you don't come to this with any kind of sage like knowledge i think something we've touched on before is this idea of curiosity and actually being curious about hope in and of itself is actually a really hopeful thing and I think you Julie in all the conversations we've had but there's you know the stuff that I've heard you do working with you as an actor I think you're a naturally really curious person and that's why, yeah, I think that's why I wanted to talk to you, but also I think I wanted to open up this conversation because it's like, what can we give to each other? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. And um, and I've been thinking about it a lot today in preparation for tonight and, uh, and drawing on some of the books and texts that have helped mm. me in dark times politically dark times in particular rather than personal dark times yeah. and you know greater minds than the mind that have had so much to say on this mm. and I thought that a, a good and interesting place to start might be to talk about what hope isn't 
because yeah. I am concerned that people might come along to this webinar thinking that this is some kind of self-help program yeah. or that there is some sort of um, positive thinking which yeah. of course there's nothing wrong with positive thinking at all but there's a real real difference I think between deep hope and optimism and mm. about how to achieve that and how to work towards that and a sort of blind faith and wishful thinking or a denial about how hard things are so I yeah. think the starting place from all of this is to admit that things are really, really shit at the moment and really bleak. <laughs> you know, we, we are living at a time when it's clear the NHS is suffering hugely from the cuts and from various political decisions that have been made over many, many years. You know, we're seeing more and more people struggling to get the help that they need. Mental health services are in absolute crisis. Um, politically across the world, big things are happening. Obviously, the Ukraine, but all the wars in all the countries that we care less about is still raging. The refugee situation remains horrific and brutal and inhumane. And of course, there is the climate change crisis <laughs> oh you know are you still there everyone are you still here <laughs> it's just going hopeful yes, <laughs> i mean really you know helpful. i really am thinking that if you're not feeling a little bit mm. in despair then you might possibly be a sociopath <laughs> so if you are feeling despairing pat yourself on the back for not being a total sociopath and actually giving a shit about the world and, and how it exists at the moment you know so that has to be the starting place you know mm. the the but so it, it isn't about making ourselves feel better about the way things are yeah. and in the introduction to this this discussion tonight Anna you know you asked me a few questions as we sort of made trailers for tonight <laughs> and the question that you asked me was like what's the most unusual place that you've uh, found hope or seen or witnessed hope and actually I thought about that a lot since we had that conversation and and I said at the time that I'm never surprised to see it. And I think that it actually exists much more in the spaces where people have got every right to feel in total despair and desperation. Yeah. So anybody who is working in a hospital or some sort of homeless shelter or refugee camp, they will all talk about human spirits in a way that you don't hear people talking after they've been, for example, to a spa. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, there is there is a, a a survival instinct in us, and an agency in us, and a, and a determination in us mm. that keeps us going and keeps us believing that things will and can get better. Yeah, and I think that that it's twofold. I feel like there is the the belief, but there is also the steps that you take towards that belief because they're, they're, they're mutually exclusive. You can't have one without the other. Otherwise, it is blind faith. So, for example, on a personal level, if you were to say, I would really, really like to be a writer, for example, um, I wish it for myself. I hope that one day I can be a successful writer. But if you don't take any steps in the direction of being a writer, even if they're small, incremental steps every day, then that's never going to happen. Yeah. If you want to see change politically or globally or with the climate, then you can't just say, there's nothing I can do about it. I just hope it will get better one day or, or just turn your back to it because it's just too awful and too insurmountable. Mm -hmm. and, and in reading around it today, some of the most interesting stuff that I've read today has been about perfectionism mm -hmm. and about people. And I've, and I've witnessed this so many times in my life. And, you know, when you read something, you're just like, that is what it is, actually. And I'm pretty sure that it was Rebecca Solnit that said this. So this is this is a book that um, we'll put in the uh in the chat as a resource so Any this is in the chat yeah so this is Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark and it's a book that she wrote quite some time ago actually um and uh and she talks in this about 
this idea of perfectionism and about people who sit on the sidelines of political action and say, well, why are you bothering? There's no point. Who believe that if, if you're doing something imperfectly, it's not worth doing. Yeah. So if you are doing your recycling every, every week and really trying to be good about that, if you're cutting down your meat consumption, if you're trying to walk more and use uh, your car less, all those things are tiny, tiny things. And yes, they're not going to reverse climate change, but it's really, really, really important that we keep making those steps. And the naysayers who sit on the sidelines and say, what is the point when China is doing what it's doing and India is doing what it's doing, whatever, are people who are the enemies of hope to me and the enemies, and, and they are actually doing the powers that bees work for them because yeah. I truly, truly believe that it is in the interests of the people who are in charge to keep us in a state of despair, yeah. to make us feel that there's nothing that we can do to change things, to keep us afraid. You only yeah. have to look at certain newspapers. It's all fear monging. We're going to be flooded with immigrants. We're going to be flooded with people who are going to take our jobs and our lifestyle from us. If we eat too much of this or drink too much of this, we're going to die of cancer. Everything is about keeping us yeah. in a state of fear. And, yeah. the, and, and what it drives us to is a place of consumption mm -hmm. and of mm -hmm. isolation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when we talked about this before, you you mentioned about um, the powers that be want to keep us in our houses. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, that this idea of like not reaching out, not reaching out to each other, not venturing out. Um, I you sent me this book before Christmas when we decided to do this. And I it's actually had a really profound effect on me because firstly, what I wanted to say quickly is that I think that I feel like hope's like a muscle, like, like I've been thinking about hope and talking about hope and reading about hope. And it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, feeling curiously powerful from all of that. And, but what I really, what excited me about the book was I think that I've been sort of nurturing this idea. And I think this is quite a common kind of thing that certain conditions need to be right for hope to thrive. It's a little bit like if we've got any writers here, sometimes we say, we've got to have our desk just so in order for us to sit down and write. You know, procrastination is all about us thinking the conditions aren't right for us to do the thing that we need to do. And I think that we often feel or we're led to believe that there needs to be certain conditions for hope to be in place. Whereas actually hope, hope it are the is the condition needed for change and I think that in a sense you know we um talking about you know you were talk, we're talking about what hope isn't I was thinking a lot about I've been thinking about a lot about what hope is and thinking about how you know I really think it's about connection and at first I thought it's about human connection. It's about people connecting to each other. And then I thought, well, hang on a minute. There's plenty of people who live in quite an isolated way with very little human contact. I'm not, you know, it would be unfair to dismiss them as having no hope. And then I thought, well, it, then isn't it about connection? It's about connection um, to something or someone or, you know, to the earth, to art, to something like that. And I thought that yeah. was really that was really interesting. And that this idea of hope in the dark that comes from Rebecca's book is if things are really bad, the potential for hope is great. And I think that's something really exciting that really kind of yeah. sat with me, you know. From yeah, the it's a fertile ground, you know, it's, it's a fertile ground ready for us to sow our seeds and yeah. And to harvest later. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to read you this. This is something that that absolutely just nails it for me. So this is um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, who's uh, an American Democrat um, politician who's absolutely wonderful. And, um, and this, she posted this on Instagram 
at the day of the reversal of Roe v. Wade in America, when people are just like, oh, this is just getting ridiculous. The Supreme Court, you know, is so right wing now that they can just overthrow laws, you know, willy nilly. And it's a really desperate situation, actually, no matter who's in power there. Um, And she she just she put this really great thing. Somebody sent her the question, are we screwed? (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, and this, this is what she put. My honest view is, it links completely to what you just said, Anna. My honest view is that things are likely going to get harder before they get better, and we will need to stick together. What is important in moments like these is not to think in binaries, good, bad, screwed, not screwed. There is no doubt that things are bad, some things really bad, but they may likely get worse. But that does not preclude the fact that slowly but surely some good can be growing as other things fall apart. Mm. This is not some syrupy, sweet, silver lining case for optimism. Rather, it is really about a choice all of us will have to make in life, either consciously or unconsciously. Will I be a person who is safe and who creates good for others? Will I be a person who stands up? Will I be a person who primarily minds my business? and serves myself or try to be part of something bigger or will I just be a passive neutral observer of it all Mm. what I sometimes tell my staff is that the world we are fighting for is already here I love this it exists in small spaces places and communities we don't have to deal with the insurmountable burden of coming up with novel solutions to all the world's problems much of our work is about scaling existing solutions many created by small committed groups of people that others haven't seen or don't even know are around the corner so while we can't change the world in a day we can and do have the power to make our own world within our four walls or our own blocks mm. we can grow there with the faith that somewhere out there everywhere others are doing the same and we will come together That's why if you're a parent, how you parent matters. If you're a neighbour, how you're a neighbour matters. Many of our biggest problems are results of massively scaled up isolation from others. That means many of our solutions can be found in creating community. Ultimately, we live in this world and in this time. We have no choice but to engage in it while we're here. Even running away is a form of engagement. So will your engagement hurt or heal, build or bring down? There is no neutral choice. So we can at least do our best to make good ones and learn and do better the next day. You are allowed to be scared, to grieve, to be angry, but you are also allowed to create good, to be soft and enjoy the small reprieves. Struggle lasts as long as we do. And I just thought that was absolutely brilliant yeah. that that it exists, that the, the world we want to exist is happening right now, but in small spaces that we yeah. might not even know about. There are people doing amazing good things every day and we have to start small. We All we have to do is take small steps. I read another brilliant thing in a, in a book called How to Change the World, which is one of the School of Life books, oh, keep going. Yeah. which yeah. is by John Paul Flintoff. And he said that we all think that we'll be heroic. We all want the opportunity to run into a burning orphanage and bring out, you know, <laughs> save the children. But, but very few of us are willing to wash up for our mums. Yeah. And I love that. <laughs> no, what? It's, it's so absolutely true. And what I'd like to talk about in a sec, actually, is like really thinking about what are those small acts and what are those kind of um, tangible things we can do but just to touch on that point that you just made um I think like yeah we it's thinking down to minute detail and again it's coming back to connection and I think it's about the connections that we have with people so I'm a I love running and I listen to the Nike the Nike running app and I listen to coach Bennett's guided runs and I'm like his biggest fan I tweeted about him the other day as someone that gives me hope and he retweeted me and I honestly was (laughs) My name's Vince Jelly. I absolutely adore him. And for anyone who's listened, it's very, you know, if you feel like you want to run, but you don't feel like a runner, it is absolutely there. The guided runs for you. They're so, um, so brilliant. And he talks in it about, oh, Julie, they're great. They're great. And he talks about how when you go for a run, this is early in my sort of journey with him. When you go for a run, you're not just improving yourself and your mental health and your physical health, but you're also improving the world around you. And I remember sort of saying, I mean, that's true. And then (laughs) my, my friend pointed out what he means is that after you run, 
you feel better about yourself. I mean, there's not a single time I've been for a run apart from I fell down a hole on Christmas Day, but there's not a single time that I've been for a run that I've not felt great about it afterwards. And then the interactions that you have with the people afterwards, you you are bringing something new. You're bringing a hope or an energy or whatever. And I think that really that really kind of got me thinking. And we talked, didn't we, briefly, Julie, about about those small acts. So like, I don't know, where where do we start? Is that a weird question? Is that a- No, I think, it, I, think, I think it's a really good question. And um, I, uh, this, <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep recommending books, but, but you know, like I say- Oh, it's great. These are greater minds than mine. And these are the places that I turn to. And I went back to this book today. I can't keep doing, this is, this is Kay Tempest. Oh yeah. Um, I love this artist and it's written really with artists in mind and it's about the creative process but it is about connection and it is about the way that we go about our daily interactions with people and and you know this I need to learn from this it, it's the fact that we saw our culture is one now of going along of improving yourself of trying to better yourself of trying to have experiences that are about um self-care you know and bell hooks talks about this and is really interesting about this what's missing in these conversations is the idea of community and friendship and neighborliness yeah. Yeah, and yeah. just about your and your tiny interactions with people every day now I have it you know I can get sometimes if I'm not in a good place and somebody comes to me um wanting to talk to me about Coronation Street which is you know the the job of my life and it's the the thing I'm, I'm most well known for and sometimes I'm just not up to it because because and it's it's my my ego rears up. I'm, I'm I'm you know please forgive me. I am making myself vulnerable in admitting this, you know, because it's not something I like about myself. It's something rears up in me, which is just like, why do you only know that piece of work? I left that job nine years ago. Why are you talking to me about that? I've done other things since. Uh, why are you reducing me to this one thing that that ended so long ago? And mm -hmm. it, and it is it's ego. And actually, you know, sometimes if I can let go of that storyline if I can let go of that and, and connect with the person who is talking to me and get past that what I realize is that that storyline for many many different reasons has impacted people mm. and very often if I start an interaction with a little bit of spikiness because they've, they've called me Haley instead of Julie or whatever and then I sort of stick with it and, yeah. and go they will tell me extraordinary things about themselves. I, I am I'm so privileged to be somebody who, because of the character I played, who was very likable, people want to tell me their own experiences that, that might be about being LGBTQ or about their own cancer experiences or right to die experience, all things that were developed and, and discussed during my time there through my character. And um and it makes, it makes me realise everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. And we're all, and I know this is such a trope, it's such a cliche to say this, but we are all so attached to our phones. We walk around with our earphones in, we, we walk around with our faces in our phones. And what Kay Tempest talks about is just having a day detox from it and just going out into the world and just connecting. Mm -hmm. And the difference those little interactions can make is, is yeah. absolutely enormous. And, and it is, and it's seismic actually. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to you about this before, Anna. Um, this is one of the great things that that I'm involved in it, and it wasn't my idea and I pinched it off someone else Josim this wonderful actor set this up and, and I nicked the idea and, and did my own version of it in in Manchester and there'll be some people on this webinar I'm sure who are from this group we have a group called 500 Acts of Kindness mm -hmm. and basically all it is is that each one of us sets up a standing order and we give a pound a week and it's it's nothing you know to most people I mean some people can't afford that I, I understand but it's sometimes it's changed down the back of your setting 
and it's a pound a week and because we have so many members now that adds up to about i don't know i don't know how how much but probably about a thousand pound a week and then anybody in the group is then free to nominate anybody in need and we've just given over we've given about two hundred and ten thousand yeah wow. two hundred and ten thousand pound over three years now and anybody who comes to us no questions asked we can just say yes we will pay that debt yes we'll pay your gas bill yes we'll buy you a carpet for your new home we'll do this and the hope that it engenders in this group of people we have a facebook page and we get so much more from it yeah. than we give this pound goes out and we, we barely think about it, most of us. Mm -hmm. And what we get back in terms of the gratitude and the life changing mm. effect it can have on people, you know, and it, and, it is, and it is a matter of just people just being able to breathe more easily. And it is a band-aid over a gaping wound. And sometimes I feel guilty about that. You know, I, I sometimes think we're not actually affecting any change. We're just we're just giving people some money to help them this week. But yeah. that, that matters. It's meaningful. I think it is. I think it is about meaning and it is about uh, connection. So I think, you know, when the nurses were on strike recently, I was, you know, reminded of the nurses that were there that looked after my mum when she died and they they utterly held in their hands the power to make this very painful experience as comfortable and easy as it could be or as appalling <laughs> as it could be um and and the power in that and you know the some of the exchanges that I've had with them or ex exchanges with other doctors or nurses over my life of various things you know that's just one example of like an interaction like that a, a, a piece of kindness or a, or a piece of connection piece of connection a connection matters and it can last a lifetime and I think there's something interesting as well Ju like so with the Rebecca Solnit book she talks about how we can't save anything right we're not going to save anything and the idea hope is not the idea that everything is going to be okay no because ultimately for, for for a large majority of people I would say our biggest fear is death often and it's one of the only things we know without a doubt is coming to us we live in a society that is completely unwilling to look at death you know people talk about in insurance adverts we say if the unthinkable happened how can it be unthinkable it's the only thing that's definitely going to happen so yeah. so this idea that it's not all going to be all right in the end no. but but we can it but 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 that's the definition of what what all right is we can improve our own lives and other people's lives through small or big acts and those things last they have a ripple effect or they have like a they have a life and people remember think you know people talk about the kindness of strangers and stuff I think people remember that so you might be giving something material but it's about the the gesture of it that can last a lifetime and I think you know and I think that examples like um 500 acts of kindness is a great example of something small you can do if you are able to afford it um that that can have an impact that does have an impact it's like a really great example I think yeah I, I think it is and I think it and, it and it is about connection because it connects us with people who we'll never meet who we have been able to give something to with without any return I mean there's a massive return actually but you know on, on paper there isn't and you yeah. know and, it, and it's astonishing people are just like what well, what do you need do you need proof can I send you my you know my my universal credit letter can I and we're just like no you don't need to send us anything at all we'll just give us your bank details and we'll just transfer it to you and mm -hmm. the difference that that makes but as I say the thing is is is, is what we get from it and yeah. it is the, the ripples of it and we won't know we and this is the other thing that I love about Rebecca Solnit's stuff is that idea that she has of of that you don't know how things change things. You know, yeah. I mean, we, we do tend to think in 
absolutes. She, she talks a lot about uh, Latin America and sort of political movements in Latin America. And of course, you know, that's reason to be cheerful, Lula in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's probably saved the world by a few years, you know, <laughs> by the Amazon rainforest not having been cut down as much as it was going to be under, you know, the other twat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, that, that's good. Things change all the time in Latin America. They go through these huge things in a way that we don't, hear, you know, so they're very politically, passionately politically invested. And, yeah. and they, there's a real there's a real heart to it, you know, to politics there. And here we see it as something that exists sort of separately to us. Yes. And actually we don't yeah. see ourselves as part of change. Yeah. Yeah. And actually change is happening all the time. And, th and this is something to find hope from, I think, that when you think of the last few years, it's easy to think, well, this hasn't changed. We, you know, we're, we are screwed, you know, climate wise, you know, until people start paying attention, nothing's going to change. Actually, you know, there are things that seemed like an absolute impossibility. Gay marriage is a really good example of that. Yeah. It's suddenly happened you know there's this thing called the Overton window which I, I love the idea of which is an Overton window is just yes. like a, a period in time when when things happen and yes. so things are outside it and seem unbelievably just absurdly preposterously impossible so yes. it's just like so so votes for women will have been that one time it's like that's just that's never gonna happen you know and then yes. Gay marriage. Also, so we've we've gone from like the AIDS crisis and the, and and Section Twenty Eight to equal marriage rights for, yeah. for gay people in such a short space of time. Things change all the time, and that doesn't come from nowhere. That comes from small groups of people just keeping at it and keeping at it and doing their thing and being laughed at and scorned and mocked and derided by perfectionists standing at the sidelines going like, oh, why, why does gay marriage uh, matter? We should be the counterculture. We shouldn't be, you know. It, the, no, it hasn't brought about complete equality for LGBTQ people. Oh. Of course it hasn't, no. but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, she talks about in the book, when um, when something is in the future and hasn't happened yet, it seems impossible. Like yeah. you say, gay marriage, wrote, uh, votes for women. When it's in the past, you look back and it's an absolute inevitability. You can't believe it was, you thought it could never happen. Do you know what I mean? And I think, yeah. I think that is um, a really important thing to remember and that change comes from the people, you know, that it's ratified by politics, like politicians, are the last, are almost the last step in the road, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. but Julie, how would you, so how I'm, what, <laughs> I'm interested in um, what you think being an activist is, or like how, how can people become activists? I think, I feel like, it's something that I really aspire to, but I feel like it's something that I've I've not fully committed to. And from what you're sort of talking about, um, it, it feels to me like it's something that we can, activism is something we can do in small ways all of the time. And so I suppose just to kind of really, to be as, to give us a kind of like uh, tangible takeaways from this as possible, what sort of things would you suggest or would, kind of get you going or, keep you kind of fulfilled in terms of doing stuff well I mean it the, the idea of activism is really interesting in it because it's like you know there's certain people who call themselves activists and certain people who don't you know and you don't but you are you know because you're yeah. you're I mean you know the, even the acts of making these webinars you know and going like okay how can we give people hope in these in these very dark times that is that is activism yeah. absolutely yeah. is yeah. you know the many many things that you do behind the scenes you are you are a woman who gets shit done Anna <laughs> Jordan you know and so that is activism <laughs> <laughs> you really really are though you know and it's kind of and I, I think that people see it as just being dedicating your life to you know, yeah. the, you know dismantling the nuclear program or or fighting climate change and I know people like that you know my my beloved nephew is mm. you know he is somebody who got a first at university and in another lifetime, a few decades ago, would probably go into parliamentary research and then work his way up to being an MP, maybe, you know. And what he's actually doing 
is, is a climate activist, he's volunteering at Calais for three months, and he wants to set up an alternative community. You know, those people are standing outside, you know, they, they really are creating a counterculture in a really impressive and exciting way, you know, and that gives me hope. Young people like like my nephew yeah. give me hope. Yeah. But that it doesn't have to be that, you know, you don't have to be, you know, throwing tomato sauce at the sunflowers, you know, it's like you you it is in the small things that you can do. And again, it's easy to be put off. Every time you share a petition and sign it about something, that is activism. Mm. If you have been through something in your life, I am in the incredibly privileged position have I been through my work met so many people who have done incredible things from the darkest and most terrible times in the life you know mm -hmm. my friend Maggie Watts who who replied to our Facebook thread Hi, Maggie. I think Maggie might be here um Maggie lost her husband to pancreatic cancer and and instead of <laughs> you know rolling over and never wanting to get out of bed again which is what most of us would do in in that instance I feel she decided to campaign to dedicate her life to campaigning for better funding and awareness around pancreatic cancer and she was determined to get it debated in parliament and got a petition to a hundred thousand people and, uh, and and it coincided with with Haley's storyline in Coronation Street and we became friends we went to parliament together for this debate which was incredibly exciting and of course you know things are still really really bad in terms of pancreatic cancer but awareness is definitely growing around it and research is definitely growing I know people who have you know, Sylvia Lancaster, who lost her daughter to a brutal hate crime, set up a foundation practically two days afterwards. Nicola Graham, a great friend of mine, lost her little boy to a brain tumour and has set up a, an amazing retreat that looks after and hosts families who have got children with life um, uh, life threatening illnesses or disabilities. I mean, these are, I am surrounded by people who have turned darkness and despair in their lives into yeah. activism and hope and 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 how could I not feel hopeful when I'm surrounded by that you know and and people who just keep fighting as well for for a better society and a better world people who are working you know I, I noticed this this fashions for activism and I you know and I'm as as guilty as anybody for it you know there was when you know, when there was the Af Afghanistan crisis, the, the most recent one, and people were coming and, and people were welcoming um, Afghan refugees with open arms. And they were, Care for Cali were overwhelmed by by um, donations and the warehouses were full and they had volunteers. A month later, you know, it, they were back to normal and they had all these these donations, nobody to sort them, you know, because because the, the, the wave had passed and, and that... And that's okay. Even if you just gave a day to doing that, you know, and, and you haven't dedicated months and months to it, that's okay. You know, yeah. it's enough to have done it. It's it's enough to have dedicated hours, minutes of your life to help other people. It's It makes a difference. What you do, this is the definition of hope, that what yeah. you do matters, that it has an effect, that someone somewhere is benefiting from what you do and as an, an actor as, a, as an artist it's a constant battle people saying you're preaching to the converted you make a piece of work that is about something you care about you put it on people who care about the same things as you come to watch it and it's like what's the point mm. I run a political theatre in Manchester and I've had that thrown at us so many times again it's the perfectionist sitting on the sidelines do you yeah. really think you're going to change anything with this well actually yeah I do and the reason that we change things through it isn't because people come and get their minds changed as I've said many times we don't do take back America on the the night of the inauguration of Donald Trump and somebody in a MAGA hat comes in and like the scales fall from their eyes and they realize <laughs> the error of the words that's not why we do these nights we yeah. do it to come together and mm. connect and embolden each other and to feel less isolated in what we feel about what's going on in the world and yeah. from that we have conversations in the bar afterwards and we go out into the world with a newfound confidence and a spring in our step and a, and a feeling of being much less alone and yeah. that matters that is activism it matters yeah. absolutely and I think you know um 
I'd love to talk more. We, we haven't really got time, but I'd love to talk more about, you know, the idea of getting away from your phones. You know, you you recommended the, is it Johan Hari's book on Pick of the Week? Stolen Focus, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. But but what um and really interesting, but also, you know, um being online does give you many, many opportunities to connect all of the stuff that I've done, the creative check-ins, this um is is accessible because of the internet. So it's not just in-person stuff. There's plenty of stuff you can do online. Um also, um, I want to ask you something quickly, uh, Julie. I can't believe how fast the time's going. I could really natter away to you forever. Um, before we sort of open up to questions, I know some questions have come in and Jane's going to field those for us. What I wanted to ask you is, thank you for saying that about activism. I think you're right. I think there's all, almost, I think, could I describe myself as an activist or is someone going to say to me, but you're not because you didn't do this and you didn't do that. So um, it's, I'm appreci appreciate what you say. We've talked a lot about finding power from making connections. I have um, quite a lot of people, friends in my life going through the most the sort of darkest um, struggles. I've got friends who've had parents recently diagnosed with cancer, uh, you know, people going through fertility problems, baby loss, which is something that's really close to my heart. Um, I'm not asking you to draw on anything personal, you know, uh, but... What would you, I mean, for someone who feels they don't, there's the resource isn't there to reach out. They are literally trying to maintain and survive their own lives and get through the day. Like, what would you, what would bring you hope if you were in that situation? Or, you know, if when things are personally very dark and difficult? Well, you know, it, it's very difficult, is that because, again, I, I feel like I'm not a mental health professional and I'm not somebody who can advise properly oh, on so that. So. And I and I also don't feel like um that hope is necessarily about that. You know, it's it's yes, a belief that things can change and do change all the time, uh, a feeling of things pass. Yeah. You know, I have like you have known people who've gone through unimaginable grief and loss in their lives and the way they've always described it to me or the way someone once described it to me very helpfully is that um the the loss stays the same size it doesn't yeah. it never diminishes but your life and your world gets larger around it so oh. so it's it, it never it never never goes but your life gets bigger mm. and the amount of time you have without that person mm. without mm. that relationship without that that person that you loved is gets longer and you know and and through that we heal and we connect with other people who've been through similar things and it's really really important to remember yeah. that whatever it is that you're going through someone else will be going through it too and that's something that I think that's really really difficult to remember when you're having a very bleak time yeah. and there are always resources I mean yeah. they're stretched you know and we know that mental health services and, and bereavement services everything is stretched to the absolute hills and it's very difficult to get but there, there, there are people there to help and, and it's really important to talk and to connect yeah. And to just get out in the world and look up, you know, yeah. look up and out because, because, you know, all we want to do sometimes is stay in bed and pull the covers over our head and just numb ourselves. You know, it's, it's, we all have, have soothing tendencies. We either drink or smoke weed or eat too much or scroll through Instagram. We all have, things that, that we use to numb ourselves. Mm. And I think it's important to do the work and know what your tendencies are and to yeah. know when you're going into that place and do something different, break out of it. We have to we have to keep looking inward in order to affect change outwards. And I really do truly believe that, not in a in a self-helpy way, but yeah. in a way that is about truly connecting with other people and and shifting things you know for and being available to other people too because like all those amazing people who've been through all these terrible losses 
they are the best people that I know. Mm-hmm. They are the best people that I know. And they're the most open and willing to talk to other people about it. It's Absolutely. incredible. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Um, Jane, shall we go to some questions? Do you, do you want to bring yourself in? Uh, hello. Hi. Um, this is Jane, everyone. Everyone. Thank you for your questions. You can keep sending them in now and I'll keep looking at them as we go. Um, just uh, let's start with this one. Uh, how did you, each one of you feel about the, sorry, how did you feel that the current pandemic affected the perceptions of hope, desperation, shame, guilt, etc., compared to before COVID? So how did COVID affect your kind of views on it? Well, I think that, I think that COVID did some incredible things in terms of connecting us despite the isolation of it i mean the 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 impulse the absolutely irrepressible human humane impulse to connect with other people and help people and do neighbors shopping and organize things outside for for communities i i, I found that incredibly heartening mm. i feel like there's been a little bit of a backlash from it now I feel like now I sometimes feel like when I'm driving I feel feel like people are quite angry at the moment it's almost like there was a promise of a world you know and I'm saying this obviously against the backdrop of the terrible loss and grief that happened but I do feel like there, there is a little bit of like oh we were promised something better beyond it and we've gone back to it and we've got to keep pushing through I think and keep those connections going yeah I mean the invention like the street group it's an incredible thing to me that like you know I think properly grew up in Thatcher's era where community was something that happened in like church halls and was jumble sales and wasn't anything to do with me and like I remember when the pandemic first started it was like everyone was trading stuff and like leaving things on doorsteps people were getting to know each other I mean I don't actually live there anymore, but I'm still on the street because I love all seeing what's going on again. And Griffey still lives there. My son still lives there. But I think, you know, that's like, I mean, that's sort of an isolated, not an isolated example, but that's a kind of very specific example. But I think, I think it absolutely did, um, did bring more of a sense of community. And I think, I mean, I said this to you the other day, Julie, I think the worse things get, the kind of people are. I don't know if I, I, maybe it's to do with me or a change in myself, but the more people want to connect, the more people want to talk. I mean, I live in London. I've always lived in London. And when people say Londoners aren't friendly, I just, I, I think, I don't know. I don't, that's not my experience of Londoners, you know, but we won't get, won't get started. It's, <laughs> it's, that, it's really interesting what you say about the, it's again, what we said at the beginning of this chat about, you know, people who have most right to be bitter are the least likely to be often and and you know I've been reading a lot about uh, the Calais refugee camp at the moment because I'm doing a play about it in the new year well it is the new year in a couple of weeks and um and I and what comes up over and over and over again in that is yes the divisions between you know different nationalities and different people you know and the and the struggle but the unbelievable generosity of people you know I mean everything I'm reading from volunteers is that they go in and people want to share what little they have yeah. with them you know and and I've been in hotels where the buffet opens and we're practically like you know elbowing each other's you know out in the eye to get to a buffet <laughs> before anyone else and in a refugee camp people are just like oh please have this like half yeah. my bread that might be the only thing I eat today and and that seems to come up over and over again and the other thing that I'd say about the Covid I, I noticed on the chat that somebody from Canada is here and saying that you know that Zoom has enabled this you know it's something that's so part of our lives now and uh and yeah and I feel like that is something really good that has come mm. from it because you know people with access needs people with disabilities or people with you know with a neurodiversity have been asking for this kind of provision for years and years and years people on low incomes who can't afford to be in person at things you know and although it is no substitute for, for human connection and face-to-face for sure it has opened up a world to a lot of people who've been campaigning for that for years. So that's another positive thing about it. I hope that answered it all right, James. Yes. Big, big, big that's great. 
That was lovely. Um, I want to ask, um, yeah, I'm going to ask this one, practical kind of things. What types of stories do you get hope from? Gritty films, dramas, or cheery ones? <laughs> um, I, I think I get them from gritty stuff. I think I feel like, I feel like be, being hopeful is never about a denial of how hard the world is. Mm. I, I find the most hopeful things are things where people, arts where people are struggling and triumphing over mm. over struggle. So so the films where people have been through unbelievable loss or pain or hardship or dispossession and, and have found a way through it. That I mean yeah. I, I love films like that. Yeah, I'm the same, Julie. I mean, I'm sort of a, the things that are, interest me most are kind of unlikely friendships. So unlikely connections that people make. And, you know, um, I was talking to someone about this just today, about this idea that, you know, when I first started writing, people were quite keen to categorise your work. Do you write comedy? Do you write drama? Mm -hmm. And like, whenever people talk about genre, I mean, I understand why the word genre exists and what it means, but I just, it really turns me off. Like, I just love... I love stuff that reflects the truth of life. And the truth of life is that it can be gritty and it can be incredibly dark, but also there's humor and there's joy and there's um and there's love and connection between people. And those are the those are the things that give me hope, I guess. But also I think when you see a, a story that is beautifully written and, and beautifully executed by wonderful actors and shot beautifully or you know perform beautifully or whatever I mean that is fucking hopeful right that's just it's beautiful that you you get yeah. to share in that there's joy in beauty there's joy in beauty for sure yeah brill let's have another Jane and um, we've got time for one possibly two more yeah, let's see if we can put in two more um what do you think about the idea that hope is the other side from fear and that you can't have one without the other hmm I think, I, I, yeah, I, I wonder whether that is is right. What the opposite of of hope is? Mm. Is it fear or is it? You know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about about optimism as well. You know, and how that differs from hope. You know, and, and you know, Arts Emergency are a wonderful group that um, that campaign for better access to the arts for people from disadvantaged groups. They're a brilliant organisation, and their slogan, one of the slogans, is "Optimism is our weapon." Mm. And I love that, you know, because it's basically that is that's your weapon against fear and despair. I think to to have hope and to believe that with work and with steps in the right direction that you can change things and I think that we all live in fear we all live in fear of failure of, of poverty of isolation and loneliness and death all those things you know but we do have this spirit we have this like little sort of flame inside us that doesn't give up and and I think that is hope I think that is hope yeah and I agree with that. And I think that while I think it's quite possible that they are kind of flip side of each other, I think it's important to remember, and Rebecca Solnit says this really well, that that to have hope isn't the eradication of fear. No. Like she says, to truly embrace hope, you have to learn to embrace uncertainty. And I think that can be really frightening. But also when you think about it like that, it can be incredibly liberating because it's like, Oh, I don't have to control. I don't have to try and control what's happening. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? I don't have to try and control what's happening to me. I can, I can. Yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 there's another, another book. I keep putting it in the wrong place. Radical Happiness, Moments of Collective Joy. Joy. Yes. Uh, Lynn Degal. Great line from this. Joy doesn't betray, but sustains activism. And when you face a politics that aspires to make you fearful, alienated and isolated, joy is a fine initial act of insurrection. So I yeah. really love that. That actually joy, you know, going out dancing, being with other people, watching a gig, watching a beautiful film, going to an art gallery, those are acts of insurrection. Those are, those are acts of, of rebellion against fear and despair. 
I really believe that. I, I absolutely agree with you, Julie. And I think um, have we got have we got a small one to carry on uh, to, to finish with, Jane? No, they were quite big. I'm going to draw a line there, but only just because I wanted to say to you, Ju, that probably the thing that stayed with me most about that book is, and I said I said it to you on a voice note, I, on a garbled voice note, is that the idea that we are sometimes led to believe um, that we should not be joyful if everyone isn't joyful, if like, you know, the things that we've been fighting for people's, you know, um, if everyone, why should we be joyful if everyone isn't joyful? But that in itself is a kind of utopia, which is totally unrealistic. And Rebecca Solnit says that even if you kind of subscribe to that, I will not be joyful when others aren't the joy slips in she says it creeps in anywhere do you remember that part of the book yeah 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 absolutely absolutely it's joy a... slips in that's a lovely place to end yeah <laughs> not that it. it'll slip in anyway it's like yeah. i just want to you know there's a lot there's a lot of comments here and stuff and and if people want to um tweet or whatever and and, and i'll have a chat with you you know it, it's yeah. um it, you know, yeah. people are asking about young people and stuff here. Julia's asking about young people. And and I think, I mean, I get a lot of hope from young people. I know it feels like they've always got their heads in the form. But actually, you know, young people are really, really engaged in saving the planet at the moment in a way that I find really, really inspiring. And, you know, sometimes... They're not just scrolling through Instagram. They're actually connecting with people from all over the world about stuff that matters, you know. It's kind of... Yeah. But it's, um, yeah. I think that's a lovely point, Ju. If we, if you do want to carry the conversation on, if you use the hashtag conversations about hope, and if we haven't been able to cover your, um, your question, and I'm sorry, we haven't been able to fit many in, then, and then we'd be lovely to carry the conversation on. Um, I just want to really thank Nikki. I want to thank Jane. I want to thank everyone that's helped. And I especially want to thank Julie for being such a fantastic, um, just a fantastic person to talk to and a great well, friend. Anna, thank you so much for organising this. It's such a lovely idea and I was quite nervous about it, but it's been really <laughs> lovely to chat to you. And 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 thank you, Jane, and thank you, Nikki. And um, and yeah, yeah, just just it, I'll be really interested to to carry on coming on as a as a participant, you know, as you talk to other people and um uh, and just and I will just people asking about 500 acts of kindness, which you can just find on Twitter or Facebook. Um, but I'll I will send to Jane um the the information about how to join if you're not on any of those platforms and then um, it'd be lovely we you know the more the merrier the more people join the more people can help so thank you for that and thank you Anna thanks so much thanks everyone and just go uh yeah just tweet us anything else you want to know all right lots of love everyone take care bye bye, bye.